thanks everybody for hosting me. I'm uh, delighted by this invitation. Uh, I guess I'm also a wee bit surprised and almost intimidated by the invitation because I myself have not done any work in the area of connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, I have done a bit of work in what I think of as more traditional areas of traffic control, where mostly I've been concerned with how infrastructure, like ordinary traffic signals, might be used to decongest cities. Uh, still, I have at least a layman's appreciation for the great potential that autonomous and connected vehicles uh, bring to, to improve road safety and performance. And I appreciate that the CAV space offers all kinds of interesting questions that need to be explored. And this, of course, is always appealing, especially to us academics. So on the other hand, I, I'm almost a bit concerned that talking about ordinary traffic signals might seem a little like old news. And I understand why that might be the case. I mean, over the years, in this more traditional realm, lots of different ideas have been proffered. And recently, so we see sometimes ideas that are being touted as new turn out to be more like just small extensions to old ideas. And these ideas sometimes are rather complex and not always very impactful. Uh, and yet, I've been working with some of my Berkeley colleagues of late to figure out how to move this slide projector. Technical assistance, please. Already my talk's going downhill and I haven't even gotten to the second slide. Usually I get to like third or fourth before I have problems. I might, what, but that's not the right button. What will I do next time? That one, okay. All right. These are my Berkeley colleagues who I told you I was working with. And uh, that work has shown us that uh, ordinary traffic signals can be retimed uh, to decongest cities quite dramatically, uh, much more dramatically than anything we've seen in the literature. And today I'm gonna to talk about one of those means of doing that. Yeah. What I hope you might find interesting is that the ideas I'm going to talk about are not the result of building upon existing ideas that may already be kind of complicated. Quite the contrary, when we did this, we kind of stepped back and we asked ourselves, what if we sort of started over from scratch and wiped the slate clean, what would we try to do? And the ideas to emerge from this turn out to be remarkably simple and still very effective. And that's good news because if one has a very effective signal timing strategy for decongesting cities, and if that strategy turns out to be simple to understand and simple to deploy, and if it doesn't require much, if any, additional technology, then this idea is probably more likely to be tried in real settings where it might do some good. Um, my hope too is that the ideas that I'll discuss today would be of particular interest to people who work in the CAV space because these promising ideas that I'm going to talk about could surely be made even more effective by exploiting what connected and autonomous vehicles have to offer. And I'll say a few words about that towards the end of the presentation. What I am going to present today, if I can figure out how to move the slide, is uh, is, an, is a scheme for coordinating traffic signals on four-way grids. What we mean here are grid networks that serve traffic in all four travel directions. The traditional objective, and indeed our present objective, is to enable as many vehicles as possible to pass through as many intersections as possible without seeing a red. Okay. This, of course, would increase the rate that trips are completed on the network and diminish network-wide delay and congestion. Now we propose means of doing this quite effectively by timing a grid's traffic signals in very simple but rather unconventional ways. What we're gonna do is we're gonna prioritize the largest flows, the flows that are headed, headed toward select neighborhoods like downtown neighborhoods in the morning rush and away from those neighborhoods in the evening. To start the discussion, Let's suppose that we have, let's suppose at least for now, for now, that we have a network that is a perfectly orthogonal or rectangular grid. We'll have two sets of parallel streets, perhaps running north-south and east-west, and we may have on equal block lengths like you see here. And we're gonna suppose that every intersection is signalized. Let's further assume that there's one or more neighborhoods 
inside this grid that is rich in destinations during the morning rush. So maybe we picture a citywide grid like this with a single downtown area. Now it turns out it is quite simple to provide excellent progression to traffic that are headed toward the downtown area in the morning rush and away from that area in the afternoon. It's actually easy to provide excellent progression over the people's commuters full length of their trips, even though their trip paths are likely going to involve two distinct travel directions, okay? So for starters, let's suppose for now that the grid is undersaturated, meaning it's not plagued by residual queues. Now we might imagine a morning commuter who starts her trip perhaps traveling northbound, maybe she travels through many intersections and never sees a red. Then she turns westbound. What's gonna happen then is she's gonna see a red signal at her next intersection. But as long as she continues to travel towards the heart of the downtown, she'll be able to travel all the way to work, perhaps traveling through many intersections and not see a single green. And the same can be said of any other inbound morning commuter. Okay, like this one you see here. Now, when the intersections on the grid become oversaturated, such that residual queues form and grow, we propose switching the synchronization mode to one that will cause drivers to see red lights at some intersections. But the strategy that we propose is going to be far more effective at reducing delay and congestion on oversaturated networks than anything we've seen in the literature. And the strategy that we'll talk about is gonna remain a very simple one. Uh, I'd also like you to keep in mind that we can reverse things in the evening rush as commuters leave home, leave work and go to home, go home. Uh, we can also apply this idea to cities that have multiple downtowns. And very importantly, we can apply this idea to irregular grids, to grids that are not laid out as perfect orthogonal in perfect orthogonal fashion. In fact, as I'll mention towards the end of the presentation, we think we can apply these ideas even when the network of interest doesn't really look like a grid. Okay. First though, we need to define something here. An important measure in this realm is the elapsed time, say between the initiation of green times from one intersection to the next in a given travel direction. We call those elapsed times the signal offsets. And keep in mind it's the signal offsets that we're trying to synchronize across intersections. Now in our work, we're gonna somewhat unconventionally uh, define an offset at an intersection J relative to a reference intersection that is located somewhere else on the network, okay? Now to understand the challenges here, let's momentarily simplify the discussion. Let's assume for now that what we're trying to do is synchronize offsets, not on a four-way grid, but rather on a simple two-way arterial, like you see here. Now, it's very common practice to run all the signals on the same cycle length so that offsets can be maintained once they are established. Now, as regards to establishing offsets, if we synchronize them to get good progression in one travel direction, say the westbound direction, then of course, these offsets are now set in stone. And in all likelihood, these offsets are not going to give very good progression for the opposing eastbound direction. And because of this simple complication, it is somewhat common practice to synchronize signals to favor the heavier flow direction at the cost of giving poor progression to, to the opposing direction. Now this strategy also makes a good deal of sense because favoring the higher flow directions will be more effective in increasing trip completion rate and reducing congestion and delays on the network. So keep this little idea in mind as we move forward, because now we move forward to talk about the more complicated case of the four-way grid network. Here again, it's fairly common practice to use a single cycle length for all the intersections on the grid. And maybe we're gonna try to synchronize offsets for say the east-west streets. And maybe we try to prioritize a certain direction, maybe the heavy flow direction, Let's assume for discussion that that direction is the westbound. Okay, well, once we establish those offsets, once again, they're set in stone and there's no reason to think, there's no reason to think that these offsets are gonna work particularly well for the opposing eastbound direction. But now with, on top of this, with a four-way grid, 
the offsets we've established for westbound are probably not going to work very well on the orthogonal direction for the phases that serve the northbound and southbound movements. Okay. Now, trying to get good progression for these other three travel directions is typically what is taken as a challenge when coordinating four-way networks. Okay. And methods for doing this fill up the literature. All kinds of techniques have been tried to this end. And I would say, in my opinion, the techniques tend to be kind of complex. Moreover, and this is kind of important, uh, the focus of all the work that I've looked at and we've looked at is on steady state traffic in light congestion. And that's kind of problematic because that's not what generally happens in the real world during a rush. So this is what kind of motivated us to step back and reconsider things a little bit as if we were starting from square one. And in doing this, we decided that, yeah, we also propose running all signals on a grid with a common cycle lane. Nothing unusual there. Maybe I'll mention that because our interest is in the rush hour, we're going to use the largest cycle length practicable. And most jurisdictions consider this to be around 90 seconds, give or take. Okay. Now, what is unusual about our strategy is that we propose giving all the intersections on the grid the same green time. Meaning for a two phase situation, the, the, the green times for the east-west movements are gonna be the same for all intersections on the grid. And we can say the same thing for the north-south phases. Now, first question, what should those common green times be? Well, we propose selecting green durations that will enable us to serve the same number of vehicles in orthogonal direction, meaning we wanna allocate capacity, equal levels of capacity, equal amounts of capacity to those two directions, okay? So then we might select green phases that are inversely proportional to the average number of lanes on the streets. So if we had a situation where on average, the north-south streets had fewer lanes than the east-west streets, we might then give more green time to those narrower north-south streets. And if on the other hand, on average, east-west and north-south streets all have the same number of lanes, then we'd use equal green splits throughout. What we're proposing here is setting green times that are independent of traffic conditions. We will not be setting or adapting signal timing to accommodate what individual drivers want to do. Instead, we'll accommodate flows in ways that benefit the system. And even though some prominent theorists have recommended this approach for a good many years, our, uh, our use of a common signal plan, that is our use of common green times, is not at all common practice. Quite the contrary, the custom is to determine each intersection's green times based on local traffic conditions, meaning based on directional flows at the intersection. In fact, when most people talk about adaptive strategies, what they're referring to is strategies that adapt to driver preferences, strategies that change each intersection's green times, perhaps even from one cycle to the next, as directional flows change at each intersection. Uh, in the literature, indeed, I just want to point out there's a real focus on optimizing green times to satisfy local conditions. But as we reconsidered things, we conclude that rather than trying to optimize signal control locally at each intersection, we're going to try to optimize for the system. We're going to try to maximize the rates that vehicles complete their trips, again, to reduce network-wide congestion and delays. And the thing is this, using a common signal plan using common green times enables us to exploit a feature of perfectly orthogonal grids. It enables us to choose signal offsets that will give near perfect progression to the bulk of the traffic. Okay, so let's demonstrate how we might choose offsets using this small grid, but the idea works just as well for very large grids as we're going to suppose that here we have a single downtown area that you notice is kind of on the lower left side of the grid. Okay. Now, the workplaces where commuters are destined during the morning rush are gonna be spatially clustered throughout this downtown area. And workplaces with many and few employees are represented here with large and small blue circles. Now, these workplace locations, of course, are going to have a center of gravity. 
And let's suppose that this center of gravity is as shown by this square. Okay. Now recall that we're going to measure offsets relative to a reference intersection. And we're always going to take that reference intersection to be the one that's physically closest to the center of gravity of those workplace destinations. Okay. In this case, it's the intersection with the red circle. Uh, every link now on the grid will be synchronized in the travel direction that's likely to carry the most traffic. Maybe you notice that this is kind of akin to the simple solution that's sometimes used on arterials. So in the morning rush, the heavy flow directions will be the ones that point towards the reference intersection where those many workplace destinations reside nearby. I'll show you some examples of inward pointing links. You'll notice we've got both horizontal and vertical ones. Okay. Now to explain how we're going to obtain synchronization in two orthogonal or two inward pointing directions, uh, let's keep the discussion simple and just assume that all the street links are homogeneous, meaning they all are described by the same fundamental diagram, which means we're gonna use equal green splits throughout in this simple, in this simple example, okay? Now, so for the morning rush in undersaturated conditions, you recall that the objective is to achieve forward progress that is focused toward the reference intersection. And we're gonna call this focused forward progression or FFP. Thus, the offset for an intersection J is simply the free flow vehicle travel time on the shortest path between intersection J and the reference intersection with modulo cycle length. So if you imagine the free flow trip time between intersection J and the reference intersection is say 100 seconds, and the common cycle length is 90 seconds, then that means for a given inbound direction, the signal is gonna turn green at intersection J 10 seconds before it turns green at the reference intersection. Now this I think you'll agree is a rather simple idea, but with this simple idea, every link pointing to the reference intersection enjoys focused forward progression. In other words, in the morning we'll have this FFP, this focused forward progression on every street block in the inbound directions, such that inbound vehicles, once they get started, and as long as they keep moving closer to the reference intersection, will have to stop at at most one intersection for a red. Okay. Now this is possible because in any single direction, all signals have the same green time. So an inbound vehicle that travels straight through an intersection without turning, say at the start of its green time, is gonna to arrive to the next downstream intersection at the start of its green time and so on down the line. And by the same token, a vehicle that's traveled straight through an intersection near the end of its green time is gonna to arrive to that downstream intersection at the end of its green time and so on, okay? We get perfect progression, except when you turn, as I said before, then you encounter one red, one red time, one red signal, okay? So again, you can imagine a northbound vehicle traveling through many intersections without seeing a red, turning westbound, seeing one red phase, and then proceeding again towards the, ref towards the reference intersection without seeing another red, okay. no matter how long that trip might be. Now, this is true for any path because on a grid, every inbound pointing link lies along a shortest path to the reference intersection. Okay. And I'll just point out, we could synchronize signals in this way across a very large citywide grid, or we could just restrict our synchronization to select zones within the larger grid. Keep in mind, all we've been talking about here so far is undersaturated cases. But as the rush wears on, residual cues may form and grow such that operations become oversaturated. Now, once links have persistent cues, forward progression is not going to work very well because those forward moving platoons are going to be impeded by those cues, okay? But you know, even with those spillover cues, morning commuters should still predominantly use the links that point towards the reference intersection. Even with quiet quitting, we don't imagine a, a commuter sees a cue and turns around and heads home, all right? So because that's true, we're gonna continue to focus on these inbound links but we no longer seek focused forward progression. Now instead, we're going to synchronize offsets as per the motion of backward waves that travel through cues as per kinematic wave theory, okay? So in, over, in an oversaturated case, in other words, offsets will once again be synchronized for the shortest paths that point to 
or we can say that are focused toward a reference intersection. The only difference is before with undersaturated conditions, we might imagine an observer who sees green time by always sees green times by traveling forward with a free flow vehicle. Now with oversaturated conditions, we might observe, we might consider in our heads or picture in our heads an observer who sees green times by traveling backwards with a backward moving wave at wave speed W, okay? So the offsets are established in this way, much like before, okay? And uh, just like before, uh, well, we're gonna call this by the way, focused backward progression or FBP, okay? Now, what happens with FBP, with this focused backward progression, is that a green phase at an intersection J is only going to occur after the downstream Q starts to move forward. So I'm gonna show you this little cheap animation I have. And what I'd like you to look at is intersection J. And I want you to notice that it's not gonna get a green time until the left bound Q starts to move. So here we go, let's roll our animation here. There it is. Now what you notice is traffic discharges through the green at intersection J without being impeded by any downstream Q. And just like before, we can apply this focused backward progression over an entire citywide grid, or maybe we just want to apply it at certain zones within the grid, if only those zones become oversaturated during the rush, okay? So what we're actually proposing here is an adaptive strategy, but it's not adaptive in the customary sense where, for example, signal timings might change at each intersection on the network based on local traffic measurements. No, what we propose is not a local-based or an intersection-based adaptive strategy, but rather a zone-based strategy. So imagine at the start of a morning rush, all of the signals in this large grid might be operating on focused forward progression. And then as the rush wears on and some areas, some zones become oversaturated, it's in those zones where we apply the adaptive control and we, and we toggle between forward and backward progression. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, now, <clears throat> mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a bit of a detail here I'm gonna gloss over. As offsets change within a zone, we're gonna be interrupting phases. Because of this, if we don't do any intervention, we might find ourselves with unduly short phases when we switch between the synchronization modes, when we switch between forward and backward progression. Now, of course, unduly short phases are gonna be very dangerous, especially for pedestrians. This is a problem, but it is a problem that's really very easy to fix. And in our paper, we offer some algorithms that not only eliminate short green time, short phase lengths, they also make sure that the transition between forward and backward progression happens promptly within usually about a cycle length. Okay. Now, more interestingly, let me just say that uh, in the evening rush, again, the directed pass will now fan away from the reference intersection as commuters leave work and head home. In this case, we're gonna set offsets using the same equations as before, except now the signs for the speeds of the moving observers will change. And this will give us what we're gonna call dispersed forward progression for undersaturated conditions and dispersed backward progression for the oversaturated case. So, yes, and recall that we can apply these ideas when we have widely separated workplace clusters as in a multi-centric city. And very importantly, we can adapt these ideas in very simple ways uh, when the grids are irregular, okay? Now I'm gonna show you how we can do these things as part of some numerical analysis. And this will give us a chance to see how our ideas, how our little method will stack up for various scenarios. Uh, of course, uh, we had to do the analysis with simulation and we used the Aimsun microscopic traffic platform. We'll look at a simple case first where we have a grid that's formed by two perpendicular sets of 20 parallel, but unevenly spaced streets like you see here. Okay. 
The separations between the streets range from 150 meters to 250 meters, which is the kind of thing we might see in real cities. And the streets are gonna have two lanes to serve each direction of traffic. And for simplicity, we're gonna say that the links are homogeneous, again, just assuming they all have the same fundamental diagrams. Okay. Now, importantly, we're gonna take this shaded and centered six by six zone you see here to be where we implement adaptive control and toggle between forward and backward progression as circumstances dictate, okay, as traffic conditions dictate. Now, each intersection on the grid has a 90 second cycle. We're gonna go with two phases and equal green splits, equal green splits because they're homogeneous links. So we assume all links have the same number of lanes. As far as demand goes, well, that's represented by this cumulative count curve. What I want you to notice is in the first hour, we have the highest demand rate. The demand drops a little bit in the second hour. And in the third hour, we have the demand drop to zero. We only did that so that we could serve all trips in a single three hour simulation. Okay. Now we're gonna say that our basic scenario is a morning commute whereby workplace destinations are distributed in Gaussian fashion. And this, this Gaussian distribution is centered in the middle of the workplace. And we'll say that this distribution has a standard deviation such that 40% of the workplace destinations reside in that centered six by six zone where we're gonna apply adaptive control. Okay. Now with these inputs, the inter the, this entire grid always becomes very congested no matter how we coordinate the signals, but the severity of that congestion is gonna depend on what we do. So the first thing I wanna show you is give you an idea of just how congested this thing gets. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is a sample path of vehicle accumulation on the grid shown on the x-axis versus the grid's trip completion rate shown on the y. And this is for a single three hour simulation when we coordinated all the signals on the grid using what's called zero offsets. With zero offsets, what happens is say, all the green times in the east-west direction occur at once at all intersections on the grid. Okay, this is a rather common coordination scheme that's used when network traffic is congested. Now, these little numbers, these little labels that I hope you can see, those are time stamps. Stamps. They're the elapsed minutes in simulation. And what I want you to notice is that traffic conditions devolved to their worst from minute 60 to 120. You'll notice we've got high accumulation, meaning high congestion, and rather low trip completion rate, okay? So yeah, after minute 120, you remember demand dropped to zero, so the network begins to decongest, but peak congestion, that is the fullest extent, the largest congested footprint on the grid happens at minute 120. This again was when we use zero offsets. Now, it's reasonable to ask, can we do better than this can we do better than the congestion, the peak congestion we obtained when we used zero offsets? And the answer to that question is yes, we can, but what other coordination strategies should we try? Because the literature is filled with all kinds of strategies that claim to be effective and we cannot test them all. But one thing we noticed is that when someone develops a new network coordination strategy, they tend to compare the performance of that strategy against a computer program that's called Synchro. Yeah. And what Synchro does is it adjusts coordination schemes iteratively until reaching a best performance. And invariably in the literature, when somebody tests their new strategy against Synchro, the new strategy always wins. It always outperforms Synchro. And they use various metrics for this. But you know, it doesn't outperform Synchro by very much. Reported improvements range from one to 5%, whatever the metric was, okay? So from this, we conclude that Synchro seems to be regarded as a kind of a gold standard. And so we wondered how well our strategy might compare against Synchro. Could we, for example, outperform Synchro using various metrics by more than just say 5%. And what I wanna say, just kind of wave my hands here without getting too far into the weeds. We did our very best to set up a test that was going to be fair to Synchro, okay, as fair as we could be. Now, again, remember, this darkened data point you see here marks the state of network traffic at peak congestion when we used zero offsets to coordinate the signals, okay? Now, the triangular data point that I show you here 
is peak congestion, the worst things got on the network when synchro was used to coordinate all the signals. And what you'll notice is we've got less congestion now with synchro than we did with zero offsets. Synchro improved things by 15% in terms of the, the accumulation. And that's great. But look at what happened when we compared it to our adaptive strategy. Okay, that's the red dot there. Um, we, our method reduced peak congestion relative to zero offsets by 40% and was a 33% improvement over synchro. And it goes without saying that 33% is a lot bigger than 5%, which are the reported benefits from other efforts. Okay. Now, a staunch, I, I think perhaps a staunch defender of synchro might complain because with our adaptive strategy, we used this adaptive, we toggled between forward and backward coordination in that six by six central zone. Whereas synchro, on the other hand, always looks for the best forward progression. Now, frankly, my response to that concern would be, well, that's synchro's problem, actually. And in fact, that's kind of a problem of all the strategies we look at. But it's a kind of a funny thing, because when we deactivate our adaptive strategy, that is to say, when we just use our focused forward progression over the entire network for the three hours, we don't use any adaptive control. Well, we still manage to outperform synchro by a pretty wide margin, as you see here by this green square. Okay. Um, so let's, let's now look at the maximum congested footprints under these various coordination schemes. So these, are how, these show how much congestion spread on the 20 by 20 network for the various coordination strategies. You see in the upper left corner, the congested footprint at minute 120 was rather large with zero offsets. It was also rather large with synchro. It gets a little smaller when we used only our focused forward progression, and it's smaller still when we used our adaptive method. Okay. Now, looking at the lower column and the smaller footprint suggests that our, method might, that our methods might clear congestion from the network earlier in the day. Congestion might be shorter lived. So to explore that, let's rush ahead 30 minutes and let's look at the congested footprints at minute 150. Here with zero offsets, there's still a good deal of congestion on the network. Same with synchro. There's a little bit of congestion on the network with our forward focused, focused forward progression. But when we used our fully adaptive strategy, by minute 150, the congestion had disappeared. Let's look at one final metric here, okay? Uh, this is a time series of the simulated vehicle accumulation on the grid that occurred using zero offsets. And this is the average of 10 simulations. Now you may recall that the area under this curve is the total vehicle hours traveled on the grid. So we want curves that are small with less area underneath, okay? Now, uh, I will say this, with zero offsets, we had about 22,000 vehicle hours of delay on the grid. That includes signal delay as well as congestion delay. And that works out on average to about 13 minutes of delay per trip, which is kind of commensurate with what we see in congested cities. Uh, Synchro does better than zero offsets. It reduces network delay by 7% but look how much better our adaptive strategy does. It reduces, uh, it reduces delay uh, relative to zero offsets by 30%. It erases about four minutes of delay off each trip, which is about five times better than synchro did. So again, we're doing much better than just improving on synchro by one to 5%. And this is kind of an important point. We think that our method does so much better than synchro because synchro optimizes each of the green times, the green splits, at each of the network signals based on local traffic conditions. Really all of the methods seem to do this, but this makes it just about impossible to synchronize offsets network-wide, and it discourages drivers from choosing routes that might benefit the system. We think these findings underscore really the value of using signal timings that are identical across all intersections. Thanks. This makes it possible to uh, synchronize orthogonal directions where the bulk of traffic is headed, which is going to benefit the system. So in light of this, we decided let's forget about these intersection-based or local-based adaptive strategies. Let's forget about synchro for now. Very quickly, I'll just take a few minutes here 
I'm going to show you a few more outcomes from a few other scenarios. And in each case, we'll compare how well our strategy does versus zero offsets. Okay. So next thing, let's look at dispersed workplaces. We'll go back to the morning commute, but we'll ask ourselves, what happens when workplaces become more spatially dispersed? You remember in our, in our baseline condition, we had 40% of the workplaces resided within that six by six central zone. Well, what would happen if it was only 30% or 20%? Okay. So this is time series of this, excuse me. These are, these are the vehicle hours of delay on the network, the percent improvement that we got from our strategy as compared to zero offsets for various uh, dispersion settings. So this first case, 40% is our baseline case. Okay. Now, what I want to tell you is that as workplaces became more and more dispersed and were spread out more over the network, the network became less congested because vehicles didn't, so many vehicles didn't have to force themselves into that central zone. Okay. Now, what you'll notice is although our strategy always outperforms zero offsets, the magnitude of that improvement diminishes as workplaces become more dispersed and the network becomes less congested. This baseline case of 9%, this corresponds to a case where workplaces are completely uniformly distributed over the entire 20 by 20 network. Okay. In this case, in this kind of unrealistic case, our adoptive strategy offers no, no value over zero offsets. And that's not surprising because now there's no directional traffic towards workplaces. There's no directions that predominate on the network. Okay. The point is our strategy seems to work pretty good, but it gets less effective as the network gets less congested. What about when we have a multi-centric city, say with two downtown areas? Well, here's what we did. We just came with two Gaussian identical clusters of workplaces, and we put them at, at, at uh, symmetric locations on the grid. The dark circles you see here, the shading corresponds to the number of workplaces nearby. So what we have here is a city with two downtown areas, one on the east side, one on the west side. Long story short, what we do is we divide the network into two components, each component is associated with one of the clustered workplace destinations. And then we synchronize offsets on these two sub networks independently. And when we did that, we reduced total network delay by 20% relative to zero offsets. Very quickly, what happens in the evening commute? We just reverse things. Workplaces are now the origins. Uh, homes are now the destinations. When we set the offsets that way, we get a 34% reduction in delay relative to zero offsets. Last but not least, very importantly, what happens when our network is not a perfectly orthogonal rectangular grid? Okay, this is an important question. Uh, you see, if what we did is we took our original 20 by 20 grid, and what we did is we added random zero mean link length to each street link. The standard deviation of that added link length was 20 meters, which is what we see in many cities. Okay. So now with this irregular grid, if we use the formulas that I showed you earlier, we're liable to get poor progression on some links, which could have a cascading negative effect. This is a problem with Synchro and with all the other strategies we looked at. So what we do is rather than trying to get perfect progression on some links and poor progression on other links, we try to get reasonably good progression on all links using a simple averaging strategy. What we do is we take an auxiliary rectangular network, we construct this, that is topologically identical to the original irregular grid. And the important point here is that the measurements for this auxiliary grid are simply the averages of what we see from the irregular grid. And then we use this symmetric auxiliary, or this, this perfectly rectangular auxiliary grid to come up with offsets using the formulas I've looked, showed you earlier. And then we put, when we put those offsets on the irregular grid, we reduce delay on this irregular network by 20% relative to zero offsets. <clears throat> so this is all I really wanted to talk about. Thanks for your attention. Uh, of course, there's a few bits and pieces that have to be cleaned up here. All of our findings, of course, come from simulation. So there's gonna be open questions about the realism of our findings. And I'll just point out that the real Achilles heel of uh, simulation, I think, is the driver navigation algorithm. How do drivers reroute themselves to get around queues? 
We just used aim sum's default value because we didn't have a better idea. The point is we're gonna have to try these ideas in real settings to see how well they work. And with regard to that, there's this open question about when we start deploying the ideas in real settings, what's going to happen when the real world complexities of what's out there get further and further from the, from the assumptions we made for this theoretical analysis, all right? Biggest, there's several concerns we can talk about here, but the biggest concern is, well, what happens when maybe the network we're interested in doesn't even really look like a grid? Well, it still might be possible to make this thing work because in many instances, I think, like in Manhattan, one could perhaps identify an underlying grid from the real world grid, and one would do this by maybe ignoring some links and some intersections. We wonder how well it would work then if we took this underlying grid, used our method to come up with the offsets, and then applied these offsets to the real world non-grid network. Something worth doing, perhaps. All kinds of other things to consider. What about when we have multiple phases to give protected left turns and so forth? Uh, what if we have really short link lengths, et cetera, et cetera? All of these things really need to be tested in the field. I will say that if, if we do some field testing and it turns out these ideas work more or less pretty well, then of course, connected and autonomous vehicles could really improve the performance of our method by one way, by one obvious way, is by serving as mobile probes. I mean, we could use the CAVs to determine what are the zones that become oversaturated where we should apply the adaptive control and when should we switch from forward to backward progression and then back to forward again and so forth. We could also use probes to identify centers of gravity of workplace center destinations and so on. Anyway, these are my thoughts. Thank you so much for your inviting me. Thank you for having me. Thanks for putting up with me these last 40 minutes or so. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, well, the first thing I wanted to ask was um, in your simulation with the 20 by 20 grid, yeah. why were you only controlling the six by six? Because that was the part of the network that tended to become oversaturated. Okay. Now, but that's a, that's a great question. Let me interrupt. The appropriate size, you know what the real reason is? We, that was the best one. That's the one that gave us the best finding. But we can treat the zone size as a decision variable. You could put it in the simulation model and figure out how big the zone should be for your adaptive control or where those zones should be before you ever deploy something in the field, right? Because it really depends on where, what areas become oversaturated. And in our case, it was that kind of in the six by six middle. Yeah, so in sort of related to that, um, it seems like your algorithm, it's assuming that, well, we do know this downtown cluster, so maybe just ignore that, but it seems to also assume that we know the wave speed and yeah. we know the free flow speed. Sure. Right. So but that it, just assumes we have a fundamental diagram. Right. But what I'm trying to say is it seems I'm not sure if it's fair to synchro then because your algorithm like has those ground truth values. Yeah. Like you don't have to estimate. And synchro doesn't use that ground truth info. Yeah. Shame on synchro. That's my answer. <laughs> right. Yes. Zero. My answer is shame on you because in the real world, you'd have to estimate those. And not get Estimating a free flow speed and a wave speed. That's pretty easy. That's well, relatively easy. Giving one number for the whole network. I mean, you know, it's a lot of decisions you have to make, you know, like what? Because you have the same free flow speed. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. If you have different links with different number of lanes and design characteristics and so forth. Right. You might have to come up with different free flow speeds for different links if you have a very heterogeneous network, heterogeneous links, right? But plot some flow versus density data from a loop detector or something and get a good estimate, or get a reasonable estimate. It'd still be uncertain in that estimate though. It, un, you bet, of course, there's very, of course, if you, if you plot bivariate data, there's there gonna be scattered. Any uncertainty in the simulation, right? We act, well, we had one homogeneous link no, we, we, we plotted the data and then we fit best fit lines through the scatter, which is what everyone would do if they were going to use this method. Sure. I, I just, I don't think it's such a big deal to expect that traffic engineers would have a fundamental diagram or fundamental diagrams for their links. I mean, the light hill with them theory needs a fundamental diagram if you're going to analyze something. And that's basically what yeah, we're doing here. Yeah, I think it's here. reasonable. You definitely would probably need to do something equivalent. I guess I was mainly just thinking from the sense of, is that fair for synchro or not? We, you, yeah, that's fine, but I think, I mean, is it fair that we had an adaptive strategy and Synchro doesn't? 
I don't know sure. if it's fair or not, but yeah. why doesn't Cinco yeah. have it? Yeah, yeah, that's reasonable. Um, another thing I wanted to ask was, have you thought about like the optimality of this timing plan? Like, is it going to be optimal in some special case or anything? Or? Uh, no, all we can say is when we tried, when we simulated it as real as we could with simulation, and that's a real, yeah, uh, it, it gave us very good results. There's a lot of things we didn't simulate, though. We could have done more demand and more congestion levels. We could have done shorter links. We, we could have done other things. But I, I think at some point, what, what we really need to do is we need to find a real world network where somebody's willing to try this, simulate that specific network to come up with best strategies and then try it in the field in that, in that location rather than yeah. simulating more things. I think this shows there's real promise. but. The proof is going to be in the pudding, and we're never going to be able to say anything definitive until we try it in the field. Yeah. But I, um, I would argue that the inputs you need are, are not so difficult. I, I, it, Synchro needs its, its inputs too. Sure. We just use different inputs. Sure. So, all right, I'm almost done. No, that's um, fine. So, for the adaptive part, yeah. I'm not sure, I might have missed it, but okay. what is controlling whether it's doing the yeah. forward or the back? Yeah, thanks. So, I, I skipped over a few things. So, in that six by six zone, we estimated a macroscopic fundamental diagram. That's the average flow and density averaged across the entire subnetwork. When, when the density measurements were on the verge of, showed us that the, the conditions in that six by six zone were on the verge of becoming oversaturated then we flip from forward to backward, mm. okay? Mm. And then when it, things start improving, we can go back to forward. Okay. So, so it assumes that you have, here's an assumption, and here's where you can get me. It assumes that at least some of the links in your zone are gonna have detectors. Right. Now, if you don't have detectors, well, then maybe CAVs could be the thing to use, but you do need some measurements. And it would be nice if you had real-time measurements to do this in real time, but even if you couldn't get the stuff in real time, you could probably do it with historic measurements. You know, oh, every day at 7.30, this six by six network starts to become oversaturated. So at 7.30, we'll toggle the backward. Yeah, don't, <laughs> give me that. But yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah, the last one, a bit more of a question, but mm -hmm. um, usually when people are doing traffic signal optimization, they have some objective function that's like a combination of yeah. delay and the number of stops, yeah. right? Yeah. So one thing that struck me about hearing you sort of explain your idea, it seems like you're not really considering the delay at all. It seems like really all you're trying to do is prevent vehicles from stopping. So it almost seems like your objective function only looks at- Here's what I know. All else equal, you reduce delay in any system by maximizing the outflow. So our objective is to maximize the outflow. Simple as that. Only good things will come from that. Right. right. And I guess I was just thinking like you're, you're trying to time the light so that the vehicles never stop. If they don't stop, they get to their trip and they, fi right. they finish their trips at higher rates during the rush. Yeah. They finish at higher rates and that reduces delay. But what about the idea of just not even looking at the light, only trying to minimize the number of stops? Do you think that makes any sense? Well, I, I would say for the prominent directions, we do minimize the number of stops. Once you get started, you only have to stop once when you turn. Right. So it's hard to get some... equivalent then? Minimizing the number of stops, could that be equivalent to minimizing? Sure, the sure. What I want to, yeah, because yes, because minimizing stops increases trip completion rate. And that minimizes delay. That's all I want to think about. I want to think about outflow. Outflow, that's the key. I think people haven't thought about outflow and that's maybe the problem. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, Thank you for the presentation, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. So I had a question. So I'm very intrigued by this idea of not using the traffic patterns right. to do the optimization. Right. So one of the downfalls, obviously, of doing that is when the traffic patterns change, then your, your signal pattern planning is not as effective. What? If, if a direct route to work makes you stop only once and everything else will make it worse, why would you change your pattern? And now things could happen where demand increases as a city becomes, you know, has more workplaces or something. Then you might get into trouble with some streets becoming, you know, overcapacitated. 
okay, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to you know, make some streets one way or reroute traffic or something. But I mean, the idea here, the, the core idea of this kind of progression is, I think, might be a good idea to build your plan yeah. around. That was going to be my question, yeah. was how do you expect your, your yeah. algorithm to work yeah. in terms of traffic patterns changing? Traffic patterns should really only, I mean, people are going to find what works best for them, and they're going to take a, well, it's kind of interesting, actually, not to get too far into the weeds, and I didn't say this, but uh, on the forward focus progression, you do best by turning once. Mm -hmm. In the backward progression, you actually do best by turning a lot. You could do a zigzag pattern. So if these patterns, the simple ones or the complicated ones, were to cause some streets to become over congested, you'd have to do something. You have to do something. <laughs> I don't know. Close part of the street, or reduce, you know, restrict left turns, whatever it takes to keep it from getting congested. But you could start by simulating that so you have an idea of where the problem might lie. And then you could probably get ahead of it before you actually tried something in the field. But yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, that's a good point. Things get more complicated in the real well, world than my 20 by 20 well, grid, for sure. It would work better because you're not optimizing for the traffic patterns to begin with. No, so. no, no. I just, want, I just want people to go to work and you follow the path and, and we'll let you do it. Well, I feel like I have inside information now. When I leave, I have to do zigzags. I appreciate well, that. Only, if, uh, only if Henry will try the backward uh, progression on the Ann Arbor streets. It's actually not my question, but I, I saw this good that it's a good idea to give uh, some chance for those people who are online. Oh. There's a group of people online as well, and they have uh, 12 questions right now. Well, I just know where I can go through. <laughs> Would you pick the easiest one, please? <laughs> so I, I'm going to pick the one that's close, a uh, very close to Zachary's uh, question. Um, the question is if there are accidents, yeah. if there are accidents that occurs uh, on Stop the intersection, then can you uh, can your system how 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 your system do I, I, yeah I I'm, yeah I mean you'd have to respond <laughs> obviously I haven't looked at that I haven't I mean yeah get the accident out of there quick or reroute traffic somehow so need to be all uh, one way streets or no 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 we assume it's two way streets everywhere okay you're, you're but we okay. just don't give good progression to the lower flow direction in the morning rush anyone who's heading away from the uh, reference intersection will not get good progression. And that can include some people who are still headed to their work. So you could, I mean, it's not perfect. You imagine somebody who's going to work and as long as he keeps heading towards work, he gets good progression, but then his workplace resides three blocks beyond the reference intersection. He's gonna get bad progression after that. But according to the simulation, that still works pretty well overall, but it's not a free, it's, you know, it's a free ride if you always head to your workplace, uh, if you always head to your reference intersection. Once you go beyond it, well, and you start finding cues. Not, but the thing is, give the best treatment to the most. You know, you can't do it in four waves. You can't get them all in four waves. So there's one more question that's from my colleague down on you. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so in addition to the simulation, uh, do you have any theoretical results on following the performance? No, the no, no, no. We just looked at how this thing seemed to shake out with what we thought would be kind of semi-realistic scenarios. Um, I think we have one minute, maybe. Uh, one minute. What's a one minute question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Does somebody else have one? I can explain later. So um, first off, fabulous. This is so exciting to me. It's, it's work that we have been talking about and we used to work in industry, and we always talk about like what is the big solution for reducing emissions, uh -huh. yeah, um, saving fuel, yeah. Um, and so, is there an opportunity, maybe with some sort of collaboration, to try to take this model, take the simulation, and create some financial models around it? Like, what is the reduction sure. you would see with CO two emissions sure. or gas? Sure. What what might be? Yeah, the answer is yes. And what seems would be interesting to me is pick a real location, Los Angeles, Ann Arbor, Detroit, whatever, and simulate that. And with the simulation, you can have the algorithms that will predict you know, emissions and so forth. By maximizing the outflow, we reduce congestion. We will reduce emissions. And it'll be case specific how much, but any, any, any interested city could find out through simulation and then maybe try it. Well, thanks, this was really a lot of fun. Thank, Thank you. you. So much.